Welcome to New Life Young Adults. It's good to be with you all. I'm the one that's supposed to play the pad tonight. <laughs> um, man, it's so good to be here with you guys. It's so good to be here in the presence of the Lord. He's already in our midst, yeah? So let's just jump right into that. Let's engage with what he wants to do and say that we are open to what he wants to do in our midst tonight. Lord, we surrender all to you. That you would come and have your way, do what you want to do. Sing this with us. I can't go back to the beginning. Can't control what tomorrow will bring. But I know here in the middle. the place where you promised to be you cried it's not enough unless you come it's not enough unless you come will you meet me here again it's all I want it's all you that be our prayer tonight that all we want is who he is that all we need is who he is so as I walk now through the valley as I walk now through the valley let your love rise above every field like the sun like the sun
If you're okay with it, I like to sing the bridge one more time. Um, there's something about with worship songs that sometimes you sing them because it's where you're at, and sometimes you need to sing it because it's your prayer to the Lord to believe. Not was I, never was I forsaken, and maybe you feel like you have been, or maybe you feel like you don't know where the Lord is, and sometimes you need to just sing that as a declaration in faith and ask. God, may this be true, that I could say this and believe it and live it and know it in my heart. So I just want to just sing that again one more time and just cry it out to the Lord. For a minute was I forsaken. The Lord is in this place. The Lord is in The Lord is in this place. Oh, and we thank God that you are. <laughs> we thank you that you're here. Oh, such a joy to get to worship with you. We're going to do lots more here in a minute, but just wanted to take a second and say welcome to NLYA. We're so glad that you're here. Uh, we will be meeting again next week, just like tonight, but then we will be off for two weeks the end of October and then November 2nd, we're off, and then we'll meet the 9th. So we sent that out an email. I'll make sure it's on our socials too, but just so you know. So next week we're here, then not for two weeks, and we'll keep our going in our study of Ephesians. Tonight we're going to finish chapter one, which is really exciting. Um, and I think that's it. So let's continue to worship with that same spirit. We just want to keep, yeah, just asking the Lord to be here. He's here. So may he embrace us. May we embrace him. Glad you guys are here tonight. Let's keep worshiping.
Oh man, the Lord is good, right? Yes. Psalmist right, wrote in Psalm 103, I believe, which is what this, this song is based on. He says, praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not his benefits. So can we do that together tonight as we continue singing, as we continue leading you guys? Can we make sure that we're stopping ourselves to remember his benefits, to remember who he says he is, to remember who he's said to us that he's going to be? I know I, I can't physically join you in this because I'm playing, but would you guys... Join me in spirit. If you want to stretch out your hands, if you want to close your eyes, bow your head, if you want to kneel, whatever you want to do. And before we just get into more singing, just fix your eyes on what we might call the benefits of the Lord. That he's a God of creation. That he is the maker of heaven and earth. And in being that, he is our maker. He's our creator. And he's created us with nothing but good thoughts for us. So Jesus, we praise you for who you are. We love you, Lord. Burn! 
failure and pride On a hill you created The light of the world Abandoned in darkness to die As you speak, a hundred billion failures disappear. Where you lost your life, so I could find it here. Oh, if you left the grave behind you, so will I. I can see your heart. of holiness we are consecrated to God in the holiest of holy places the angels circle God's throne and that's all they say that's what they say they say holy 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 is the Lord God Almighty oh it's so good it's so good to be in this holy space we lift up a song to the Lord. What comes to your heart? Is it holy, holy, holy? Is the Lord God Almighty? Can you just sing it with me tonight? Beautiful name is the name. 
What a beautiful day it is Nothing compares to this What a beautiful day it is The name of Jesus You are the light that shatters darkness You are heaven's king Come down My sin was great Your love was greater What could separate us now? What a wonderful name it is What a wonderful name it is The name of Jesus Christ, my King What a wonderful name it is Nothing compares to this What a wonderful name it is The name of Jesus What a wonderful name it is The name of Jesus hey. Just continue your song to Him Just continue your song to Him
with us and for speaking to us and surrounding us with your love. God, we're so grateful for your presence. Oh, it's gonna be a good evening. It's already a good evening. Can you feel him here tonight? So good. Well, before we get started with an awesome sermon from Pastor Eddie, please say hi to somebody next to you. Greet somebody, meet someone you don't know, and let's have some fun tonight. In Jesus' name. All right. Who's ready to finish chapter one of the book of Ephesians tonight? Yeah? Here we go. We're going to go from verses 15 to 23. We're going to finish it tonight as we walk through the book of Ephesians verse by verse, which I have thoroughly already been enjoying. All right. To start tonight, I am going to first show you this on the screen. This is the logo for a company called FedEx. Hopefully you all know that that exists. That's not news to anyone. All right, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to tell you something about that logo, and then I really want you to be honest if you knew what I just said or did, okay? So you don't have anyone to impress. It's, it's not that big a deal, but here's what I'm going to tell you about it, and then just be honest if you knew this or not. So um, between the E and the X in the space, there's an arrow right there, okay? So raise your hand if you did not know that until right now. That's amazing. My illustration worked. Yes. I was really hoping that there were people who didn't know that. I didn't know that until like five years ago. And uh, here's the thing. Now that I've told you that, you will never miss it. Every single time you see, you know, a truck coming by, you're like, oh, there's an arrow in, in between the E and the X. And what I just did there where we didn't see something, then I told you about it, and then you were able to see it. That's really what's happening here at the end of Ephesians chapter one. Paul's going to pray that these Christians would see something that they couldn't see, that they would be able to see things that were unseen to them. And that's the title of the message for tonight. It's called Seeing the Unseen. Seeing the Unseen. Let me pray for us. Father, um, we come open and ready to see these things. God, you know the the cry of my heart this whole week has been that there would be people here tonight that would see things that they don't see yet, but tonight they would get to see them through the work of your Holy Spirit. May it be that that's what we find in this passage. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. So seeing the unseen, we're going to start in verse 15. Here's what's going on in verse 15 and 16 of chapter 1 of the book of Ephesians. It says this, For this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus... And your love toward all the saints, 
I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. Paul hears about what's going on with these Christians and two things are going on that he hears about. One is that they have faith in God and the second thing is that they have love for other people. And that's a really great thing to be known for, that you have strong faith in God and that you love other people and that's what leads them to be thankful. So just we need to all find those kinds of people in our lives and we need to be thankful for them. We need people who are strong in the faith and who love other people. We both need those people and we need to be those people. And if you interact with anyone who's like that, you need to thank God for that relationship and for those people because we need those people. And then verse 17 continues saying that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, what he's saying is, I remember you in my prayers, here's the content of my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, that's, that's like the Father of power, the one who has all supreme power, the most high God, that he may give you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts Enlightened. Now, your translation may or may not capitalize the word spirit there. I think it should be capitalized. We're talking about the Holy Spirit. This is the work of the Holy Spirit revealed out throughout the New Testament. That he is the spirit of wisdom and revelation. That's what he does. He, he enlightens the eyes of our hearts. That's the Holy Spirit's job. But uh, you remember, we already talked about how they had received the Holy Spirit. When did they receive it? When they had heard the good news of Jesus and believed. So if they already received the Holy Spirit, then why would Paul be praying that they would receive the spirit of wisdom and revelation? Is it a different spirit? No, it's the same spirit, but the fact that he's praying shows us that he's asking them to grow in what the Spirit does, that they would see more and more of what the Holy Spirit does. It's not like the second you believe in Jesus Christ that all the things that the Holy Spirit does just happen instantaneously. There's a part of what he does that you grow into it. Um, you, you actually need more of him and you're awakened to the things that he does. This is what Jesus promised in regards to the Holy Spirit. In John chapter 14, he talked about how the Holy Spirit was going to teach us all things. Teach us all things. That takes time, right? It's, it's on, on planet earth after we believe in Jesus. He's gonna teach us all things. Not only that, but then John chapter 16, he talks about how the Holy Spirit's gonna be the one who guides us in all truth. So you see, it's not just receiving the Holy Spirit, you do when you believe in Jesus, but there's also receiving the spirit of wisdom and revelation, meaning he's gonna teach you along the way. You're gonna be able to learn the truths of scripture because of the work of the Holy Spirit. And the phrase that's used here in Ephesians 1, which I love, is that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. That there would be a spotlight or you know, a light switch that that flips on in your heart because of the Holy Spirit. So when you hear God's word and, you know, someone's preaching and it's as if someone just turned a light on a verse, has that ever happened to you? We're just like, my goodness, it just stands out. It's like there's a spotlight just on those words for some reason today. If that's ever happened to you, that's not because of the preacher. That's not something I can do. So when I preach to you God's word, it's not me that's making something stand out in your heart. That's not something a preacher can do. I'm actually really thankful that's not my job because that's a crushing weight. It's like, are you kidding me? It's my job to make sure you guys are understanding everything? No, that's not my job. My job is to proclaim as best as I can the truth of God's word. And then the Holy Spirit's the one who just puts a light on it. He's the one who brings light and you're like, oh my goodness, I now, I get it. I understand it. And not just that, I experience it. I'm ready to live this out. That's Holy Spirit stuff. That's not preacher stuff. That's Holy Spirit stuff. And that's what he does. It's just like, just like he says that that the eyes of your heart are enlightened, just like our our physical eyes. um, Some of us have better eyesight than others, right? So how many of you have have worn glasses or wear glasses now? Holy cow, that's tons of people. I'm shocked at that. That's amazing. Um, How many of you have worn contact lenses before or still do? Wow. Okay. So, um, and I'm not going to ask who doesn't need either of those because we love you. We kind of hate you a little bit, but we love you. (laughs) But I I, I didn't wear contact lenses until I was in college. And the, the crazy thing about it is I didn't even know I needed them. I was just like living life and just, you just kind of assume that this is the way the world is. Then I do my eye test and they're like, yeah, you, you kind of need a mild prescription. And I pop those contact lenses in for the first time, which was very difficult. Um, it's not a fun task. And I finally get them in and I walk outside 
and I see the mountains and I was just like a, a kid, like just like blown away with what had just happened. I feel like I could see the edges of the leaves on the mountain ridge, you know? And it's just like, wait, this is available to the human eye? Cause, cause you just grow up thinking like when you, when you don't realize that you need it, you're just like, I don't know, mountains are just this beautiful green blur, you know, like you don't realize how much is available to you. So I wore contact lenses for 14 years or so. And then just last year I got LASIK eye surgery, which uh, is this really creepy thing that they do. And they do a surgery on your eye and they just fix your eye. It's amazing that they can do this. And, uh, and then like a couple days later, actually within one day, I opened my eyes without contact lenses and I could see even better than I had ever seen with contact lenses, which is just amazing um, that that's even possible. It blows my mind that that's, that that's possible. But when you see things like that so clearly, you realize there are things that I, I thought I was seeing, but really I, I couldn't see it. Um, there, was, there was something, there was a surgery on my eye that allowed me to see that. And that's what we're talking about when we say that he would enlighten the eyes of our hearts. See guys, I've been praying this week that there are things here tonight that even though you believe, you've heard the good news of Jesus, you believe in Jesus, you've received the Holy Spirit, but maybe there are things you just can't see yet. And, and I believe that we're gonna walk through what are the things that the Holy Spirit illuminates, that he enlightens, and I want some of us here tonight to see those things that we've maybe never seen quite like we're gonna see tonight. And that's not gonna happen unless the Holy Spirit does it. And so we wanna be open to more and more of the Holy Spirit. Um, and he's gonna show us the three things and we're gonna see these things inside the passage. Now, when I say see, you know, see the unseen, I'm not talking about just observing. Uh, I mean, you're going to experience. See in the sense of like, you're gonna be able to like feel, touch, experience, grow in understanding of these three things that happen in this passage. What's the first thing that he prays? All right, so he's praying that the, that the eyes of their hearts would be enlightened. And the first thing that he prays is that we and they and you would see the hope of your calling. See the hope of your calling. That comes from verse 18, the second part where it says, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. The hope to which he has called you. Now the word hope, that gets thrown around everywhere, right? It kind of doesn't mean much uh, these days, so I wanna make sure we have a clear understanding of what I mean when I say hope here in the context of the New Testament. Hope is this, it's the confident expectation that God will keep his promises. It's the confident expectation that God will keep his promises. God has told us many things that he has promised. He says they're both coming to be or he's promised that he'll be with us. That would be another promise in the present tense. There's so many things he's promised to us and hope is not wishful thinking like, I'm pretty sure God's gonna do that or I'm sure, you know, I'm, I'm really hoping in the sense of like, I'd really like for that to be true. That's not hope. Biblical hope is confidence. That's the key word. When you think of the word hope, when you read the Bible, I want you to think about the word confidence because if you have hope, you have a confident expectation that God's gonna keep his promises. No one can convince me otherwise about God's promises because I have hope in those things. I have hope in the promises of God. That's what it means to hope. And here, the hope is in reference to your calling, the hope to which he has called you. The word calling um, in scripture, it refers to salvation. I know a lot of times when we say, this is my calling, what are we talking about? We're not talking about salvation, we're talking about um, you know, our specific assignment that we believe, our individual assignment in the kingdom of God. That's my calling, I wanna do this. And I, I don't have a problem with using that term, but as far as the New Testament's concerned, calling is specifically about salvation. It's God calling you to be his. That's the calling in, inside of scripture. And so our hope has to do with our calling and he's referring to what he just talked about in verses three through 14. We spent the last couple weeks talking about that. What is the calling? There it is, it's all those things. Everything we talked about, put them all together. That's God calling us to himself. And in Christ, three things are true. We are saved, we're being saved, and we're going to be saved. It's all those things, that's the calling. He's calling you to, to he's saving us in the sense that anything in our past dealt with. Okay, we are saved, fully saved in that sense. But then we're also being saved. There's things that God is saving us from as we walk through life. And in the end, he's gonna save us. Where all this is headed towards the day of redemption, he's going to save us. So salvation is all three of those things, past, present, and future. But here in the present, 
Sometimes I feel like I'm just crawling, you know? It doesn't feel like, oh, in the present, I get to sprint through the Christian life. No, sometimes I feel like I'm just crawling. And, and as we crawl through the present, the only way we can hope is through the work of the Holy Spirit. Because when you're, when you're in the present and you look around, you're like, well, I really want it to be true that all these things are gonna come to be, but I can't quite get to that confidence. Well, that's, that's what the Holy Spirit has to do. And you can get there. You can see that hope. You can live this hope of your calling through the work of the Holy Spirit. Because there's a direct connection between longing for the end of days, the end of the ages. There's a connection between that and being motivated in the present age. I see that in what Paul talked about in 2 Timothy chapter 4. We all know the first verse where it says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. But then what does he say? He says, henceforth, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. There's that day where it's all headed, the day. And not only to me, but also all who have loved his appearing, loving his appearing, longing for his appearing, loving the fact and believing that Jesus Christ is coming back. We're not at the end of the story yet. He's coming back and loving his appearing, which, to which he gets the crown of righteousness, is connected to what he's talking about, which is I have fought the good fight. I've finished the race. He's motivated in the today because of his confidence in what is to come. And we need to be thinking that way. Well, anytime you're in the present and it's difficult, you should think about how, and ask the Holy Spirit and say, Holy Spirit, help me have hope in my calling. Help me see with a certainty that you're gonna, com- you're gonna fulfill your promises. So that begs the question, if that's what the Holy Spirit does, how does that exactly play out? What are the ways that we live out our hope of this calling that God has had? Well, I thought of three things. The first is that uh, you don't have to despair over your failures. When you fail, you, do- you don't need to get to the point of despair because If you have a confident expectation that God's gonna fulfill his promises, he promises to be with you, he's promised to break the power of sin over you, you do not belong to sin anymore, you belong to him, that's what he's promised, and you can either see that victory today or it's coming in the future. There's no option for a child of God where you will be condemned under that sin, under any failure. And that's, that's why we don't go to despair when we fail. Yes, our response to failure and sin is the biblical response. It's confession and repentance. This is God's grace to us, that we would change our mind, that we would speak what God says about our sin, agree with him, yes, God, it's sin. Then ask God for the grace to turn from our wicked ways. It's it's changing our minds. That's repentance. That's a response to failure, not despair. Despair is where you start thinking, this is it. This is my future. You're not having hope because you're reaching despair. So we don't have to just despair when we fail as God's children because we have a hope in his promises. The second thing that it leads us to have hope in our calling is that we we don't give up on doing good. It's hard to do good in this world. Uh, It's not set up for doing good, and there's a lot of things against us as we try to do good things for God's glory, the things that he set up for us beforehand, that, that he said, I want you to live out these good things that I have for the world, and it gets tiring at times, But if we're living out the hope of our calling, we don't grow weary because we understand what's happening. The tension is is expected because what's coming is God one day, he's gonna make all the wrong things right, guys. All of it, that's coming. He's gonna make all the wrong things right. But as his kingdom, (laughs) we get to see some wrong things made right here today. And you get to be a part of that. God invites you into that. His kingdom is here, it's also coming, but it's here. And you can experience that. And that's why you you don't want to grow weary because you want to do good. You want to make some wrong things right. And that's the way you're pioneering in the kingdom of God. And and it is such a privilege and such a joy to be a child of God and not to just receive from him, but to also be a, a pioneer of what he wants to do in this world. So we don't despair over our failures. We don't give up on doing good. And then also, finally, I was just thinking about the fact that we have to grieve the brokenness of this world but with hope. Just because you have hope doesn't mean you're you're like naive. (laughs) Having hope doesn't mean you pretend that the present isn't real. You you take the time to be able to grieve the brokenness of this world. This isn't what God made it to be, right? He showed us what he wanted in the Garden of Eden. 
He said, this is what's good. This, this was my heart. I wanted to make this. Us in relationship with each other. You guys are in relationship with each other. Harmony, beauty, peace. All those things is what God made. And, and what's broken today is, is what grieves him. He's not rejoicing over the fact that this world is broken. It, it, it moves him to act out of love for us in our brokenness. And so we identify with God anytime we grieve over the brokenness. So anytime we experience loss of any kind, we grieve but we grieve with the hope of knowing where this is going, okay? So we're still present in the moment, grieve the brokenness, but knowing where it's going. So I want you to see the hope of your calling. Second thing, see how much God loves you. (laughs) You need to see how much God loves you. I know this is a word for someone tonight. You need to see how much God loves you. The second part of verse 18 says this, that you may know the hope of, to which he has called you. And then he says, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? God's glorious inheritance in the saints. Just like in verse 14, we talked about how we are God's inheritance. And, and just like he's saying it in verse 14, he's saying it again, basically in verse 18, that we are God's legacy. We are God's inheritance. And a similar thought is being expressed here. What Paul's saying is, I'm praying that you would see what is the value you have as God's inheritance. He's referencing what uh, they would have understood in the Old Testament where God's people were always or often called his inheritance throughout the Old Testament. And in the ancient times, the wealth and honor of a king would be known by his riches, by the literal amount of silver or gold that he possessed and he would have in some warehouse. That was equivalent to the honor of a king. And just like a king in the Old Testament had treasure, we are God's treasure. We're God's treasure. And there's a dissonance for me when I hear that, but that's what God is telling you, that you're his treasure God's inheritance is in the saints. And saints is, uh, you know, it's way more popular of a term than Christian in the New Testament. I know Christian is the word of choice here today, but really saints was the word of choice back then. And the word saints has just changed in meaning over time. To us, the word saint means, you know, maybe you're like a really good person or you did a really good thing, right? You're such a saint, like you did a good thing. Or then it morphed into some sort of elite class of Christian where you're so good at being a Christian that now now you can be called a saint and it's like an office inside of the church. That's not in the New Testament. You know what's in the New Testament is the saints are God's children. The saints are the church. The saints are those who hear the good news and believe in Jesus Christ and receive the Holy Spirit. That's who the saints are. And that's why if I walked up to you and we were just having a one-on-one conversation and I was like, you're a saint, you see how you'd be like, that doesn't, that doesn't feel right. And, and sometimes it's, it's worth explaining these things because if something doesn't feel right because of our culture, but it's what God says, we need to probably get over our culture at that point. Um, this is what God declares about you. Saints means that you're holy, holy as in set apart. God, is, God has chosen us in Christ, and so you are a saint, but we are saints because of what God has done, not because what we have done. God is the one who makes you a saint. It's not because of how good you are or how awesome you think you are. No, you're, you're a saint because of what God has done, not because what you have done, and we're God's treasure because he treasured us. That's why we're a treasure. It's, it's not that we're so valuable compared to other people. No, 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 that's not God's heart. He's saying, you're my treasure because I treasured you. You can go throughout this whole book and what you're gonna see is this theme that blows my mind, which is that God loves people. And he's really serious about this. It's not like he kind of loves people. No, God really, really loves people. And for some of you, you just can't get there. You somehow have gotten to the place where you believe in Jesus Christ, but you think that God's love at this level that he cherishes you just doesn't apply to you. You keep telling yourself all the stories, all the sin you've committed, all the failures you made, the things that bring you shame in your life, you just keep repeating that self to to yourself. And what you're doing is you're rejecting what is true about you. And you need to understand this is God's message inside of God's word, that you are not just loved, you're you're cherished. (laughs) God treasures you. You are valuable to him and he really does love you. 
So the implications of that are significant because some of us, if you don't understand that God cherishes you, that as God tries to bless you, you'll resist it. Because you don't think you deserve that and you're like, well, no, that's grace. That's, that's exactly what God's saying. Like, I'm not saying you deserve it. He's saying, I want to give this to you. And you cannot remove yourself from God's love. God's your father. He's, he's your heavenly father. He wants to bless you. And, you know, I have three kids here on earth. I'm an earthly father. And I love my kids, guys. They're awesome. They're better than anyone else's kids. It's scientifically true. <laughs> Daniela, Raphael, and Fiona are the best kids. And I just love them. Gosh, they bring so much joy to my life. And they also bring some pain, but they bring a lot of joy to my life. And here's the thing about being a dad. Sometimes I'm like, okay, I gotta, I'm gonna reward you for this because I'm trying to teach you the things that honor God and I'm gonna give you a consequence for this, all those things as, a, as an instructor. But sometimes I just take my kids to Chuck E. Cheese because I just wanna have a good time with them, you know? And you're like, that's the creepiest place to go, but not to them. <laughs> they love that place. <laughs> And I like that one token pays for each game. There's no seven token games. That drives me insane at arcades. But I just love, I, I love blessing them. It's part of being a father that sometimes it's not about teaching them anything. It's just like, I just love you. I just want to have a good time with you. I want to bless you. And that's your heavenly father's heart too. You are cherished by him. He, he really loves you and cherishes you. And so that's why you need to live and receive his grace, the grace in you, the grace through you for his glory. This is what he has said, and this is what he's revealing. And if you can't see that today, if you can't see that tonight, that's what we need to ask the Holy Spirit to help you see. We can ask him specifically that you would be able to see just how much God loves you. And the third thing that he's going to help you see is that you would see the power of God at work. See the power of God at work. That's in verse 19 where it says, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us, us who believe, according to the working of his great might. There in verse 19, Paul basically uses like any word he could get his hands on to, to talk about God's power. And just to add just the, to the magnitude of how big God's power is, he uses like words like immeasurable, greatness, power, uh, working, great, might. All these different words to say one thing, which is that God is really, really, really powerful, so much so that our language is limited in understanding it. My words can't truly express it, that God is immeasurably great. He's immeasurably powerful. And this power is towards us who believe, is what that verse says. Towards us who believe. What that means is it's for our benefit. God's power is for our benefit, and he's going to give it to us for our benefit, and he's going to work that out in four ways. There are four things that are mentioned at the end here of chapter one. Uh, the first one is listed right there, the first part of verse 20, when he says that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead. That's the first thing that God shows us, that he is benefiting us because he's showing us his power over death. God has power over death. That's the first thing revealed. And the, the death and resurrection, the resurrection specifically, is a massive part of Paul's theology, okay? So much so that he's going to say, uh, if we don't have the resurrection, we don't have anything. Our faith is, is nonsense at that point. It's in vain. There's nothing we have if we don't have the resurrection. The resurrection is where Jesus shows us that he has power over death. And because Jesus died and resurrected, we now live for eternity. His death and resurrection for our benefit brings life. But it's also true that as we die to ourselves, Jesus now lives in us and through us because he has power over death. In, in Christ, we're invited into the practice of resurrection. This is the invitation of the book of Ephesians that we would be practicing the resurrected life of Christ and dead things come to life. This is what God does. Not just us, our souls, our beings, the things in our lives that are dead, God can bring those things to life. And, and as you come into this relationship that God's calling you into in Christ with the power of the Holy Spirit, you're going to start seeing some dead things come to life. That's what's going to start happening. And it's, it's 
for your benefit because God has power over death, then the second thing he shows us is that he has power over darkness. Continuing in verse 20, the second part says, so he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. When Paul says that he, he raises him from the dead, but then he seats him at the right hand of the Father in the heavenly places, is the phrase he uses. The heavenly places is a direct reference to where the people thought that their gods and um, you know, magic powers came from at this time. The, the specific term was referred to as the realm above. So this is, uh, when we talked about the context of this culture inside of the book of Ephesians, is that the city of Ephesus was practicing magic and there was you know, plurality of gods and they all believed in that they, they lived in the realm above and what Paul is saying to these Christians is that Jesus, he dies, is resurrected and then is seated in the heavenly places. He's saying, above that, Above anything you can come up with, he's above that. Specifically, he's far above all rule, authority, power, and dominion. So here we're introduced to the spiritual forces of darkness. All four of those words have to do with dark forces of evil that exist in our world. All kinds of evil. And um, in the historical findings of those magical texts in the city of Ephesus and the area surrounding Guess what the four terms for the spiritual forces that people were calling upon were? Those exact words. They were calling upon rules, authority, power, and dominion. And he's, Paul's, like, he's just calling them out specifically by saying, Jesus is seated far above all the things y'all believe in. <laughs> Anything you want to lump in there, that, that force, this magical thing, whatever, all that, Jesus is seated high above those things. And then he says it also above any name that can be named because in the practice of magic in the ancient world, the most important part, the foundational part was naming the name. You had to name a specific name of a God or, or someone who would act on your behalf. And he's saying any name that can be named, Jesus is above all those names. From now until forever, he's just, you know, he's just punching them in the face with the same thing over and over. Which I've always wondered, and maybe you wondered, why did, why did these people practice magic? Would it, I mean, wouldn't you think that if they're, if they're saying these incantations with their magic books and nothing's happening, that then it would just kind of like fizzle over time? Well, I think the reason that it was so popular is probably because they're, they're saying these things, they're calling on these names. I bet you things were happening. But just because things are happening doesn't mean it's from God. Uh, there are spiritual forces of darkness. There is demonic um, entities, angels that are still moving today. And they take the form of whatever, it, whatever the human want, desires to call it as long as they're under their control. And, and the reason why all these dark things exist that we see in the world today is because, in part, of these evil forces. This is... This is something that still exists today, and we have to talk about it. The, the book's going to, we're going to talk about it a lot towards the end of the book as well. But man, if you can't acknowledge that it exists, you have no shot at being able to walk in the way God says we're supposed to walk in regards to these evil forces. If we're just like, no, I don't even believe it. But this is revealed in the scripture, not just here in the book of Ephesians, in the New Testament, these spiritual forces, and we're, they're given various names because I don't think it's taught to us like scientifically, like exactly, they do this, they do that. I don't think we are supposed to understand everything that they're doing. We just need to understand that they're out there and they're working. It, not all the things that are happening in the world can be just chalked up to our sin. Um, there are certain things that when you observe it and you study it, like genocide, like the mass murder of millions of people, and you think that's just, just one person or a bunch of people, just their sin. Like, I'm sure it is. Of course it involves that, but there's, there's some evil forces doing things. And the more you study the evil acts of our, our generation or throughout history, you can tell that there's more at play than just our sin. And maybe you've witnessed that. Maybe, maybe you haven't. And um, I, uh, I'll just share this one story where I witnessed it. I was not expecting to. I was actually at a camp in Mexico where we, um, we used to gather all the like high schoolers with a bunch of different churches. We'd go out to a camp 
And uh, it was about 500 of us. And I remember it was kind of a tense camp that year because I was leading worship and we had just introduced some drums. And so some of the churches were like, that's evil and all this stuff. And <laughs> it was not very fun, <laughs> but uh, I was leading worship. So it was kind of tense. And then we did the like quintessential camp, Christian camp thing the last night where we wrote all the things that we wanted to like give to the Lord on a piece of paper. And then we all got up and we headed towards the bonfire. You're going to throw it in, right? Like give it to the Lord. It burns up. It's an awesome moment. And uh, so we all have these pieces of paper in our hands. We head over to the bonfire and I remember walking up to the crowd and it was this pretty like <laughs> ominous feeling of like, what? what's going on? Like there's no prayer. Like it was just like something's up. And then as, as I got closer, what ended up happening is there was, this, uh, there was this girl who was on the floor and she was having an attack. And so we had like eight pastors trying to help her. And at first they were like, it's an epileptic attack. And then uh, pretty quickly after that, it was like, this is, this is not an epileptic attack. Uh, there's something going on here. And uh, it, it's for sure in the spiritual realm. And you have to understand, like most of these churches that were there, like it's you know, independent Baptist churches, like, we did not have a box for this. This was not in our arsenal of teaching. And so it's just like, all I can tell you is like, we are legitimately freaked out in the true sense of the word, where, um, like I said, you could feel it as you even got close to that fire. It's like, what is going on? And, uh, and, and it was exhausting. We started singing praises over this girl, and then you know, she would scream louder above us, and we heard things that I'm just, it's just scary stuff. Scary stuff that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a cynic by nature, I think, a bit. And all I'll say is that after this experience, I've never had to have a conversation with anyone about it as far as what was happening. That was very, very clear to all of us who experienced it. And, um, but the awesome thing about that story is what, uh, what the enemy meant for evil totally backfired on him that night. Because what ended up happening is then we go back to the worship center and I saw God do things that are some of the most beautiful things I've ever witnessed in my life that night. So, so there's this presence and, and you know demonic forces of evil and then God shows up and the reason we saw all these awesome things happen that night is because we saw the power of God over darkness. See, when you experience anything of these spiritual forces of darkness where you're like, oh yeah, that's for sure that, you desperately need to believe that God is bigger than that. And you, you have to hold on to that, that he is the one who is more powerful than the really scary thing I just encountered. And that's the God Paul's talking about. He's far above all rule, authority, and power, and dominion. And we're gonna talk more about our response to these powers uh, later in the series. The point of what we're supposed to do is not what we're talking about here in chapter one. The point of chapter one is that every single evil force, every name that can be named from now until forever, Jesus has power over that darkness. He has power over death. He has power over darkness. Then he continues saying that he has power over everything, over everything, continuing in the next verse um, where he says, and he put all things under his feet. He put all things, He's, he has power over everything. Now this is a great example uh, of how Jesus Christ is the supreme Lord over all and that's seen both in the now and in the not yet. Because all things under his feet, meaning that he is the one who's above it all, but that's not fully realized today, right? It's kind of like in the book of Philippians chapter two, you've heard that passage where it says that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess, right? That Jesus Christ is Lord. And then you're like looking around, and you're like, well, that's not happening yet. Right? Not everyone's confessing that Jesus Christ is Lord. And so what that is, is that is going to happen, but that's still to come. That's not fully realized as far as the fact that he is Lord and it's confessed. But it's true today in his kingdom, in us, his church, his people, we're confessing him as Lord. And so it's both now and not yet. That's what he's saying. He's going to bring all things under Jesus, Jesus' feet. So that's to come, but it's also still not happened yet. So he's gonna bring everything under the power of Jesus. The final thing in the passage is that he is not just power over death, power over darkness, power over everything. He finishes by saying that he is bringing power for the church. Power for the church. That's the way it's presented to us. Um, the last part of this passage says, he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. 
This is the first time we're introduced with the head body metaphor that we're gonna have of Jesus Christ as the head, the church as his body. And that's gonna be uh, talked about more along in the book. But uh, the thought, this thought, which is very interesting wording, can be summarized as, as this, that the church is filled with the power and grace from Jesus, who in turn extends his reign throughout heaven and earth through his church. That's what happens. It's, it's we receive grace and power from Jesus, and then Jesus is now extending his reign through us, both in heaven and on earth, through us, his church. That's grace and glory right there. That's how we finish chapter one. We see that it's us who are filled with power, and it's him doing it through us, that for his glory, he's extending his reign. And we need to see this. We need to see all these things. And the only way we can see it is through the work of the Holy Spirit. Maybe tonight you haven't seen that hope that we talked about, the hope of your calling. Maybe you haven't seen and, and believed just how much God loves you. Maybe you haven't seen the power of God at work. And maybe it's happening, but you just don't see it. You haven't seen it. You haven't felt it. You haven't experienced it. So to close, um, the first part of chapter one was Paul blessing God for what he's done for those who believe, the second part of this chapter is Paul praying that God would open the eyes of these Christians' hearts so that they would see all that we just talked about, that they would see it. What Paul's doing here is he's modeling for us intercessory prayer. Intercessory prayer is when you pray for someone else on their behalf. You're saying, and Paul's saying, when I remember you, I thank God for you, and then I pray these things that through the spirit of wisdom and revelation that you would see these three things in your life. So that's what we're gonna do here tonight. Um, the way we're gonna do that, it's gonna be very simple and um, we're gonna do it individually. So the way we're gonna pull this off is uh, we've set up these tables on the side, as you guys can see. On those tables are post-it notes and Sharpies. So here in a second, I'm gonna say, all right, let's, let's, let's do this thing. And uh, you guys are all gonna head to the tables, the one that's nearest to you. And all you're gonna do is this. You're gonna write your first name on a piece of paper, on a post-it. Once you write your name, rip the post-it off, paste it to the table, and then grab someone else's first name, pick it up, and then just head back to your seat, okay? What's, what we're gonna do is, that way we're all gonna end up with someone else's first name, and you're gonna come back with your post-it back to your seat after we uh, worship for a bit. Then we're gonna all pray for that person by name, and we're just gonna pray that those three things would happen in their lives. That's it. So, um, and then we're gonna get to keep this post-it. I'm gonna encourage you to keep it just for one week. That's my challenge. And put it somewhere where you would see it. And uh, whenever you see it, just pray for those three things, that they would see the hope of their calling, that they would see how much God loves them, and that they would see the power of God at work in their lives, okay? So that's, what, that's all we're gonna do. So uh, worship team's gonna lead us. You guys can go ahead and get up and uh, go fill out a post-it and then bring one back to your seat after you fill it out.
right, just going to give a second for those who are still writing, and then we're going to pray. All right, guys, go ahead and throw that screen up on what it is that we're going to pray. Just pray these three things. Here in a second, I'm going to count to three. You're just going to pray those three things. So pull up the name and say, God, I'm praying on behalf of this person's name. Just pray that they would see the hope of your calling, see how much God loves you, see the power of God at work. And then just whatever's on your heart, however you want to pray for that. But here's what I, my only request, and I know Christians in 2021 don't like doing this, but uh, that you would just do that out loud, okay? <laughs> um, so no one else is listening, God is listening, but we're going to say that together so that we are uniting our voices together in this prayer, Okay. Um, so here we go. One, two, three. The person who you have by name, I want you to pray for those three things. Here we go. One, two, three. Here we go. Father, hear the the cries of your people. We're asking on behalf of our brothers and sisters that you would do this, God. Holy Spirit, you have to be the one working. You have to be the one who enlightens the the eyes of our hearts. And so, God, we we submit to your work. We, We receive the work of your spirit and ask that it would be something that we see more and more day after day in our lives and also in the lives of those who were holding their names in our hand. So God, we declare that Jesus Christ is the one who reigns above all. He reigns with power above all rule, authority, power, and dominion. So there's nothing we can face in our future that that God is not over, that you're not over, that Jesus Christ is not far above all those things. So now we lift up our voice and we sing that back to you. Come on, let's sing. You sent the darkness running out of an empty grave. No seated alone in glory, enthroned on the highest praise. You sent the darkness running. Running out of an empty grave. Now 
Jesus, you reign above it all. Let all of heaven and the earth erupt in song. Sing hallelujah to the everlasting one. There is no high in name. Jesus, you reign above. Amen. Amen. He reigns above it all, above, far above it all, not just a little bit, far above it all. That's the Jesus that we worship. Hey, just a couple things as we head out. One is that every time I've done this thing with a post-it note, um, even though the math makes sense, in practice, there's always a few names left over. Uh, So if you would be willing, and you're like, I already have one name, but if you'd be willing to take a second, uh, please do that, all right? So just walk by the tables and just take another name and pray for those people as well. I would love it if every single name can be prayed for this week. And like I said, just put it somewhere where you'll see it. Um, I'll put mine normally on my dash of my car so that uh, anytime I drive somewhere, I just think of them, all right? And we'll just pray for them. Really just committing for a week, that's all I'm asking um, as, as we kind of live out this passage this week, all right? We're gonna pray for each other, pray for one another. Back here next week, we're gonna start chapter two and uh, it's gonna be a good one, all right? You don't wanna miss it. I will see you guys next Tuesday night. See ya.